You guys out there may be wondering, what really is minimalism? Artists during this period were rebelling against abstract impressionism. They wanted to focus on form, color, and surface rather than storytelling. Minimalist artists wanted the viewer to experience the pure qualities of form, space, and materials, also inspired by ready-mades. This is shown by how they used factory-produced objects for their pieces. You can also see the use of ready-mades by Marcel Duchamp and during the pop art movement. Many artists use single or repeated geometric forms. They also wanted to eliminate the pedestal or base so the, aud- the audience reconsiders their relationship to the art object. Serial methods used. Serial production relates to how many products at this time were mass-produced and consumed. Minimalism peaked during the mid-1960s. Minimalism styles can still be seen in everyday life today. For example, modern houses themselves can show minimalist characteristics or it can be seen in the furniture. Also, this can be seen in restaurants found in big cities such as New York. A work can be as powerful as it can be thought to be. Actual space is intrinsically more powerful and specific than paint on a flat surface. A work need only be interesting. Even though the factory made the object, Judd checked the steel and other criteria to be carefully chosen. He also challenged originality by using materials like steel, concrete, and plywood to create mostly large and hollow sculptures. Judd focused on the exact portions of his boxes, how the surfaces should be finished, and what the scale should be. Judd's goal was to do the opposite of kill traditional art, which was to make it better in every way, shape, and form. Judd's work never intended on making any emotional appeal or aimed to represent a specific subject. It's art if an artist says it is, which was a quote or a phrase sometimes used by other artists in the art world and the saying Donald Judd lived by. Untitled uses a simple geometric language and a machine, industrial look, avoiding any direct associations with outside objects. Donald Judd's Untitled 1969 was not freestanding in a sense that all the units were isolated were all and were all identically the same in front of a plain bare white wall. Each box were, was not made by him and were instead made in a factory. Donald Judd was very specific on the way the boxes were formed and on the wall, especially with spacing. The outside of the boxes were made out of brass and the t- very top of the boxes almost had some kind of a transparent sense to it. Because the, fo- the boxes were indeed factory made, D- Judd look, made the brass look like sheet metal instead of anything else that could be handmade by human. The differences in the boxes included top plane sloping inward, effect of a shallow tray, and running flat a few inches below the top edge of the side planes. Donald Judd's work had people questioning the work of art, the nature of space, and the nature of the sculptural form. He also believed art should not describe human emotion, it should be it, and constantly wanted to advance sculpture and art to improve, but also make it better. Judd fit all of this together with minimalism as a whole by wanting the viewer to experience the pure qualities of form, space, and materials. 100 Untitled Works in Mill Aluminum was done by Donald Judd from 1982 through 1986. This permanent collection at the center of Chinati Foundation, which is installed in two former artillery sheds. The size and the scale of the buildings determine the nature of the installation and Judd adapted to the building to create this piece. This relates to the wide-scale minimalism idea of including your surroundings into the piece itself. Later you will see how Dan Flavin also used this characteristic for his works. He replaced the garage doors with long walls of continuous squared and quartered windows which flood the spaces with light. The use of continuous squares expresses the theme of using repeated geometric forms to create a minimalism piece. Judd also used this style in the previous piece mentioned and also untitled Progression. One material used for this work of art was galvanized iron. This can be seen in the vaulted roof on the top of the original flat roof to double the building's original height. Using iron or the other factory produced materials is a trend you can see many minimal artists use. Although the create 
Although they created the materials, the artist would use a specific placement to create the final product. Soluit created many of his pieces using wall drawings. He believed drawing directly on the wall allowed him to achieve the objective of reinforcing flatness and making his work 2D. To create a wall drawing, Lewitt would first draw out a plan using a grid, and then many draftsmen would interpret and, interpret and create the actual piece. One of Lewitt's drafts could be created in a variety of ways depending on how it was interpreted. This video demonstrates the process that you would go through to construct a wall drawing. This first piece is titled Wall Drawing 681C. Here you can see how Lewitt's earlier drawings consisted of horizontal, vertical, and diagonal lines. In this piece, Lewitt used four basic colors, but he would layer them in a variety of ways. He related this to how a few notes in music can be combined to make a variety of melodies. For this drawing, each square started with a single base color, but ends up with a multitude of colors due to, to the layering. Traditionally, yellow and gray have color codes where yellow corresponds with horizontal lines and gray with vertical ones, but Lewitt decided to switch them for this piece. Here the yellow is vertical lines and the gray is horizontal. Like I mentioned earlier, one piece could be interpreted in a variety of ways. Wall drawing 684A started the same as 681C, but the finished products look a little different. Both pieces consist of four squares with vertical, horizontal, and diagonal lines in both directions. In 681C, the makers displayed the squares all in a straight line, as opposed to in 684A, they are in two rows and two columns. Now we move on to wall drawing 766. This piece differs from Lewitt's other work because instead of using vertical, horizontal, and diagonal lines, he now used cubes. The cubes are tilted toward the viewer to show volume, but at the same time, Lewitt still stuck to his principle of constructing work that was 2D. You might ask, why use cubes? Cubes are relatively uninteresting, they lack aggressive force, and imply no motion. It is what it is and it ain't nothing else. This quote by Dan Flavin sums up his thinking when creating minimal art. His work didn't challenge the viewer to think about the meaning of the piece. It changed and put meaning to the space around you. His pieces were 
innovative in the way that they integrated the materials with the architecture and the surrounding room. His art was made by the act of placement. Flavin's style is unique because his, piece, his pieces are constructed of fluorescent lights. Flavin was humored by the fact that when lights sit on the store shelf, they are nothing, but when he turned them on for his works, they gained status. This piece is called the Nominal Three. This is a great example of how Dan liked to include the gallery as a whole. Just three elements are spread across a wall to encompass a large area of space. Flavin was also like Lewitt because he would make technical drawings of his work before creating it and his work could be created more than once. Unlike Lewitt though, Flavin's work does have a right and wrong way and many of his large scale work has been installed wrong. Additionally, like many of Lewitt's work, you can see the idea of serial production in Dan Flavin's next piece. This picture shows a few of the installations included in the series called Monuments. Dan had a lot of respect for the modernist abstract artist Vladimir Tatlin. This series is actually dedicated to him. Both artists liked the use of commercial light fixture, fixtures, but for different reasons. Tatlin used them as a prescription for a revolutionary future culture, whereas Flavin used them to show something tang tangible and temporal. Flavin used humor to separate his work from Tatlin's. For example, Dan liked to use the word monuments in quotes to emphasize the ironic humor of temporal monuments. The pieces in the series only survive as long as the light is on. Therefore, they are not really permanent like a traditional monument. The next piece is called Monument 4 for those who have been killed in ambush. This piece is one example of how Dan liked to reference topical political issues. This piece is a response to the Vietnam War and serves like a memorial for those who have been killed. Here you can see how Dan used red lights to symbolize blood. Also, the lights come off the wall in an aggressive manner to reflect the aggression of war. Flavin had a thing for color. When referring to light, pink, blue, yellow, and green are considered primary colors. He would often use green because he was interested in how it irritated the eye. When Flavin created pieces, instead of focusing on the colors of the individual light, he liked to look at the blended effects and how the pieces pulled in its surroundings. Also, the light would work to skew the viewer's sense of time. He was so interested in color, Dan would even dedicate pieces by relating people to colors. For example, his green and yellow work was dedicated to Jan and Ron Greenberg because Jan would wear green a lot. Dan Flavin's styles relate to those of many different artists. You can see connections to other minimal artists such as Donald Judd, who was talked about earlier, Carl Andre, and Walter De Maria because of their reduction of formal devices. Additionally, you can compare Flavin's work to Marcel Duchamp's. Both artists construct ready-mades, but Duchamp's were poetic gestural art and Flavin's was sculptural art sculptural art. Flavin saw his work as more of an experiential art than a visual art. Minimalism is everywhere. Like, seriously. Everywhere. It's also in pop art. Just take a look at this. This first painting is by Frank Stella. It's called Tomlinson Court Park. What do you see? Yes. You're looking at a painted over canvas with a bunch of ridiculously straight white boxes. Just a bunch of concentric white rectangles. It's pretty much all stripped down. All that there is, is a 
black canvas with white rectangles. There's no way to elaborate on that. There's no way to interpret that. But you can be inspired by it. Take a look at the next painting. Or, they call it a print, but whatever. What do you see? Yeah, it's a red box and two white circles near the line where it turns over to a black box. Could you guess that this is an interpretation of one of the, well, arguably one of the most iconic characters of human history? This is a minimalist take on Mickey Mouse, and though it's really gruesome to think about, what the artist did was take away everything that you don't really need. The gruesome part is she hacked all of Mickey, she or he, hacked all of Mickey's appendages off. All, all you get is really a torso here. And yet you can still tell, oh yeah, that's, that's totally Mickey Mouse. Duh. This is what minimalism is in an easier to swallow pill. something and then taking away all the other somethings until you really couldn't take anything else away. You basically strip away anything that anything that's extra. can't be reduced anymore. You can't take anything else away. That is really what minimalism all is all about. It's just taking away all that can be taken away. And and still showing what needs to be shown. So, what really do the critics think? Well, some say minimalism applies a deficiency of artistic labor. Uh, I don't really see how that would be a bad thing, though. I mean, I guess it's not, because the point of minimalism is to keep things simple, so the artist is just following what you could consider the minimalism guidelines when creating a piece without putting in too much work. Okay, there had to be some harsher things said about minimalism. Well, yeah, even some open-minded critics would consider minimalism to not be high art. They believe since it was fairly simple and almost appeared blank, it could not qualify. You can compare and contrast minimalism to a few other art movements. Like John mentioned, minimalism has connections to pop art, one being both use familiar objects to make art. Dan Flavin, a minimal artist, would use lights to create his pieces, and pop artists such as Andy Warhol used Campbell's soup cans. You can see how minimalism is a breakaway from abstract impressionism in painting styles. 
Abstract Impressionism painters would use gestural brushstrokes, whereas minimal artists would use bold, solid colors to create even surfaces, concealing evidence of the artist's production. After minimalism, there is a period of post-minimalism. Here, pieces were more embellished with pictorial approaches.